What's up, everyone? Welcome to Dipped and Tone. I'm Rhett. I'm Zach. And you're back. I'm Where back. were you? I, don't worry about it. <sighs> I don't, that's none of your business. Fine. Fine. All right. So how you been? You. Uh, good, man. Good. Uh, thanks for holding the show down for mm-hmm. me while I was gone. Um, you did excellent. I, the the oh, Joey interview you. Uh, was fantastic. So, I was uh, I was stressing over it. <laughs> so, well, both of them were were really great. So, Thank um, you. yeah, man. How are uh, I mean? I I saw you a couple weeks ago. We can we can be honest, but yeah. What's what's new? Uh, nothing much. Um, we we're I am desperately trying to figure out how to grow the Mythos YouTube channel. Um, so that's been exciting. I've been like super stressed with all the business side of things because uh-huh. we're like I always feel like we're at a precipice where it's like things are really going to go. Yeah. Um, but I'm just trying to figure out how to push it, you know. Right. So, but apart from that, I'm fine. Just uh hanging in there trying to get my uh my uh my Warzone game nice and tight. <laughs> Dude, apart from aren't, that, aren't we all? I feel like it's gotten extra sweaty the last couple of weeks for some yeah. reason, you know. Yeah. But we uh, still need to think about doing a uh, maybe a, a dipped in tone game night. I see, I think that would be fun. So in the comments, um everyone say what you think about that well maybe hold on hold on it could be just for the patrons so yeah yeah thank you patreon and patrons for supporting the show if you want to learn more about that go to patreon.com slash dipped in tone but that would be a good place we could have like the discord live chat watch us yep. play um yep. it, i don't know it might be it might be too bad we just we're just basically we're going to show mckinley just kicking ass. That's all it's gonna be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Zach and I are not great. I mean, I can, I can get around, you know, if I need to, I can, we know how to play the game. You know, we can get around, you know, it's, it's fine. I think the, I think the mythos YouTube channel is a good idea. We've been talking about it a little bit. Um, yeah. you know, well, but yeah. Also comment down below what you want to see from a mythos YouTube channel. So, um, nice. More, more pedal stuff. Yeah. More pedals. Um, well, cool. Yeah. I, uh, I was in Europe for a couple weeks on tour. I mean, I say tour, it was four shows, but um, it was a ton of fun. Mm-hmm. Out there playing with Roof Man, the album release show. It was it was great, great fun. I love it over there, man. Yeah. Well, it, it looked like a blast except for the TSA, but that's it's all been covered. It's all on your YouTube channel. So you TSA and Brexit, man. Yeah. We couldn't bring our amps into London, which ended up not being an issue. They didn't even check us in Calais at the border. They just like but it was this whole to do. You basically had to get a visa for your amp and the whole thing. And it, God, it sucks. But um, mm. the show was great. And it actually gave me an opportunity. Um, thanks to Luke Bowman, who lent me his uh, his two rock. Yeah, I got to play our two rock for the first time on a gig. And it was excellent. Which one was it? The Studio you know? 35. Oh, okay. The small little compact head. Dude, yeah. it was like it was so even like running it super low because we were in a pretty tight club i had the the master volume super low and it was still it was one of the most responsive amps i've played in that setting where you're pushing the preamp gain a little bit and bringing the master volume down like really really low yeah a lot of amps will tend to collapse in that sort of setting but that thing stayed really present it was like three-dimensional um sounded fantastic and then the rest of the shows i was using a magnetone Mm -hmm. um the the stereo twilighter the 210 yeah. that i borrowed shout out to fellowship of acoustics for loaning us some gear and that amp was phenomenal yeah so, they're awesome they're yeah. so awesome nice well uh we got to mention our sponsor for the episode sweetwater we're still doing uh the the giveaway so you go to sweetwater.com slash dipped in tone get all the details you can see the 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 rigs that that red and i have chosen we can fight and argue about it yeah. so we're blue in the face but yeah some really cool stuff, and you go there, get all the deets, and enter to win. And check out Sweetwater for all your gear purchasing needs. Yep, links are down below. I saw um, Joey picked your rig over mine, which is fine. He's so did Mick. <laughs> yeah, well, they're just not as um, adventurous, I guess. They're they're you know, they're just scared. They they're, they're scared of the octave. You know, uh, well, it is it's it, very intimidating. Your choices. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Nice. Okay, so today. We've got the one and only Saddler Vaden. Now, I'm really excited. I'm a huge fan of Saddler and the bands he currently plays in and has right. played in, in the past. If you don't know, he's a guitarist uh, for Jason Isbell and the 400 unit. Literally, literally one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, and I'm a huge fan of his playing for that. He was in Driving and Crying. Shout out to mm-hmm. a Georgia band. And uh, yeah, Saddler is an incredible guitar player. 
if you're not familiar with him or his playing, we'll have links to his uh, his Instagram and socials and everything down below. You should go check him out. He is at least my kind of guitar player. Yeah. He can he can step out and rip when he needs to when it calls when it, the song calls for it. But he knows parts. He knows tone. He knows songwriting. He knows the whole process. He is a guitar player's guitar player. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So without further ado, because it's a long interview, yeah. here is Sadler Vaden. So speaking of, what is your what's your take on on this whole bad monkey situation here? Oh God, um, I it's I mean it's hilarious, and I've had one for years, and uh, they they sound good. I mean, what's funny is 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 uh, you know, I'm not surprised that you can make it sound similar to a clock you know what i mean I, th I think the thing that's that's more funny is the craze around the clon centaur in my mind and i'm not just mm. saying that because i'm not going to shell out or even have that kind of expendable income to buy a clon centaur but i think that's more funny to me than the bad monkey you know whatever like like you know going up in price and it being able to to be on the same level as a clon i feel seen <laughs> <laughs> you know because i i mean i guess i'm i've just well i've never been too much of a pedal guy like like obviously i'm a pedal guy because i play guitar right right, right. and i have to have pedals to to do things in the studio and live but um you know, when I was younger, I was way more into that. But as I've gotten older, I just like, you know, I don't know. I, I guess the, I'm, I'm less and less um, into like pedal collecting or, you know, chasing the newest thing around, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is, do you own a real clone? But I guess no, not. No, no, I don't. I don't. Um, I, I guess I've just never. I mean... I don't know. This is, I feel seen too. Ah. I guess I've just never been like that impressed by what it does. You know, um, to me, I just plug into my amp with a great guitar and great pickups and these, and I can do the same thing that that does. I feel like, you yeah. know, um, right. there's a lot of anyone that, that is, is buying a, a clone, um, you know, I don't, they, they probably will disagree with me. Um, and I have close friends that own them and love them, but you know, it's like the minute you pay a certain amount for something like that, you're going to be like, dude, nothing else sounds like this. This sounds, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, well, of course you paid eight grand for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so the, the only people I know, I think that have them. So Zach has one, but yeah. he bought one for, for I mean, I understand a pedal builder Early who on. builds a well. a clone <clears throat> version having one, but you bought it a couple years ago, and I remember you bought it and the price you bought it. At, I gave you so much shit. I was like, dude, you got you got to be kidding me! That much money for an overdrive? Oh my god! And then they've gone well, up way yeah, higher. So it, he did well. And it, it was one of those things. Like my, I, it was my birthday gift for myself, and I figured you know I've made thousands of clones, uh, copies of these things. I should own a real one, you know. And I played I played many of them. I think the one that the Jason ended up with forever ago, because that was at Carter and that was when I worked Drake. there, I went through it. Um, but yeah, I bought it and then Rhett was like giving me hell and then my wife. And then I found a gold one for like two grand. And I was like, you guys, we should, I, I think I oh, should wow. get this. And everyone <laughs> no, said, no, no, you're an idiot. No, no, you're an idiot. And now dude. they're like six grand. You know, it's so stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you're in a different situation yeah. than I am. And I, that makes way more sense. I mean, you know, you know, buy what you want, get what you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, but, um, I guess like the, the culture of like, well, well, your tone's not whatever. You don't have this or uh -huh. what? like, that's just, that's just bullshit. Yeah. You know, well, it's, it's all the people like living in the Instagram space and they see everything. And like, we feel like, these inadequacies with our gear sometimes when we should just be focusing on making music and playing and enjoying the guitar and the amp. And like, like you said, like exactly what you said. Yeah. That's what I worry about. Like say with younger players, because I remember, you know, um, there was a, there was a, uh, I never thought about that. 
like when I was 11 years old, mm -hmm. one year into playing guitar, I didn't know. Yeah. Like no. I just was, I just had what I had. And like I had this uh, Optimus, I think that was called Optimus. Remember that? Like the Radio Shack brand thing, like Optimus. Uh, I don't know. No, I don't remember that at all. I barely it was, remember it was, Radio Shack. It was an electronics company. Like, you know, they made a, I think it was called Optimus and they made an amp. Um, you could get a radio shack and they made probably like headphones and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, my parents, my first guitar was a harmony, like strat copy that my parents got me out of a, it was called finger hut magazine. <laughs> it was like a mail order, you know, it was okay. one of those like, like, you know, max, like you remember like JC Penny or bell, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. you get the, it was like that kind of thing. Just, just, you know, <laughs> like a QVC or whatever catalog yeah, kind of yeah. thing. So they ordered that for me and it was a harmony, good strat copy guitar. And it came with this amp and a, you know, crappy cable and all that stuff. And I remember, um, I was obsessed with the, the cream of Clapton, um, mm. greatest hits of, you know, which, the name of that album, The Cream of Clapton. I mean, <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah. That was the 90s for you. Yeah. And so I was obsessed with that stuff and, and especially early cream. And um and I was I was trying to learn Sunshine of Your Love, of course. And I'm like, why doesn't my guitar sound like like all dirty like that? You know? And um so I just turned that little crappy Optimus amp like all the way up and I was like, oh, Oh, there it is. Like, yes. Oh my God. I have like this, you know, distortion. And of course, like three days after playing through that amp all the way up, it just died, just completely died. You know, it's like a little solid state, like, you know, POS. I, I think I found it. Can, can I, I want to share this. Yeah. Yeah. You want to throw it up there? Oh, careful. We're about to inflate the market on um, <laughs> Optimus. And then we're going to get a bunch of shit on the gear page for it. I don't, I don't yes. know if this was, did it look like this? <laughs> Oh. oh yeah very yeah like a I, it didn't have distortion um but oh. yes that's it's mine mine was like probably newer like a like a later version of that same mm. yeah but just like a radio shack you know right i amp. bet that would um, sound killer under a microphone it's it probably sounds oh, really yeah. shitty in the best way possible <laughs> oh yeah yeah, I, and I just remember all I wanted was a wah wah pedal. Like, like it didn't even matter what kind. That's the thing, though. It didn't matter. Like I and I, you know, I saved up my allowance to go to Edwards Music in North Myrtle Beach and and get that wah wah pedal. And I got the I got a Hendrix guitar book the same day. And dude, <laughs> best day of my life. You know, <laughs> yeah. at that point, best day of my life. Well, we so, uh, uh, we should we should intro you before we get much further. This is okay. kind of a good a good podcast when you just jump in. But Sadler Vaden, well known uh, well known guitar player. I'm a huge fan. Um, Jason Isbell in the 400 unit, uh, driving and crying among other things. You put out a solo record a few years ago as well, too. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I've put out a couple solo records. Um, yeah, well, thanks guys for having me on. Yeah, really excited sure. to have you here, man. And um, yeah, okay, so that's a that's a great segue. Like, take us through. Your early days of guitar. You're you're from North Myrtle Beach or from Charleston area? Where are you from? Both, pretty much. I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina, and then you know I grew up in North Myrtle Beach. And then when I was around, it gets a little blurry. I guess when I was around like eleven or twelve, we moved to Somerville, which is yep. outside of Charleston. Mm -hmm. And then I lived there till I was twenty five years old. So yeah, I was born in Goose Creek. Oh yeah. yeah. I lived in Goose Creek for a minute. Oh, wow, nice. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So my early days of, uh, I guess you were going to say playing yeah, guitar yeah, early, or starting guitar. guitar days. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, th I've, t I've told the story a bunch, but it, it, you know, I always leave details out here and there, but, um, my, so I grew up with a lot of just music in the house, but not like instruments, just my parents were, you know, just rock and roll fans. And my dad had a really good record collection and I grew up with them having friends over on the weekends and my dad playing records and, um, keeping me and my sister up, you know, at night, um, hanging out with his friends, listening to rock and roll music. Um, so I grew up with that in the house when I was 10 years old. Um, my parents took my sister and I to see a concert called Farm Aid and it was 1996 and it was happening in Columbia, South Carolina. And mm -hmm. the reason it was happening in Columbia is was Hootie and the Blowfish was like the biggest band of all time at that point. And, um, 
they uh they were asked to play farm aid and they said well we would we'll do it if you do it in south carolina where we're from and so they said yes and so they brought farm aid to south carolina and my parents were freaking out because it was like you know 1996 so neil young was with crazy horse i mean this is like grunge neil yeah um Mm -hmm. john mellencamp um the beach boys were playing sunvolt hootie of course willie nelson i mean it it was just a, a an amazing lineup so my dad splurged for some floor seats and um we just had the best time and like i just remember neil young and the crazy horse coming on and just blowing my mind and my dad telling me all day like you know we're watching all the warm-up acts like you know it's martina mcbride and like rusted root and uh steve earl and you know all these bands and they were great but my dad kept telling me wait till the big boys come on, you know, like just wait, you know? And so, and he was right. I mean, John Mellencamp came on and just really the PA started warming up, you know, and then Neil came on they opened with, Hey, Hey, my, my. And I just remember standing on the chair and I'm like 10 years old. And I just remember like, go, 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 go. And it was just rattling my entire body. It was so loud in the stadium. And that, that just changed my life. That, moment right there and so when we went home my dad got his old yamaha fg 180 acoustic out of the closet because he was all jacked up you know and inspired (laughs) and um he started playing the guitar in his room and i was i heard him and i went in there and i was like i know you had a guitar yeah (laughs) it's like where'd this guitar come from it was buried deep in the closet somewhere um and uh he was like yeah you want to come over and you know you know mess around with it and so he he was good at figuring out little riffs by ear you know he wasn't really a player but he could figure out little things and so he figured out hey hey my my and taught me like this you know really dumb version and play it and that was the that and pink houses like i i learned pink houses in a really dumb way but those were like the first two songs i ever messed around with on the guitar so that was that's the start of me playing guitar um you know i didn't you know my parents were like well you want to take lessons and, and I did, you know, I had piano lessons at one point, but it was like backdoor piano lessons. It was like this guy that played uh, piano at this restaurant my dad worked at, you know, and and I would, he would, I'd get picked up from school and I'd go there and he'd, he'd be there already drinking and like try to show me like piano <laughs> thing. And I was like, this guy smells like vodka and like cheese sticks, you know, and Sadness. I'm not into this, you know, uh, so <laughs> I <laughs> like I was like I don't so anyway I did I didn't want guitar lessons because I associated them with the piano lessons I had cuz I was young didn't know you know uh to disassociate them yeah 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 <laughs> but but um so I became self-taught I just I just taught myself the kid down the street uh had guitar lessons and he sort of showed me how to read guitar tab and all that and so I took that information and just ran with it so yeah that's that's how I started playing, and that's how I pretty much learned how to play the guitar. Have you ever magazine. had any like any lessons or training or anything after that? Did you go to school for it or at all? Or you've just no. been self taught the whole way. I've been self taught the whole way. I did, you know, right when lockdown happened in March 2020. I um, I I had just done a trip uh, with out to Nam like a mm-hmm. couple months before that, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it was with Guthrie Trap and a few other people. We all went out there to to represent Vox. And um so that you know, it was a few months after that that lockdown happened. And so I hit Guthrie up and I was like, Hey man, like I don't know, like I'm not doing anything and you know, could I could I do like a Skype like lesson thing with you? He's like, Yeah, of course. You don't have to pay me or anything like that. Like just let's just hang out on there. So honestly, that's like the only real it wasn't even a guitar lesson, but it's like you know, he's just showing me some stuff he does. And then I ended up showing him some stuff I do, you know? So Mm -hmm. that's, that's probably like the only like real, the closest thing to like a lesson I've ever had. Man, that's encouraging, you know, for, for a lot of, I think a lot of young players out there that are learning by themselves. I mean, now there's the internet and there's YouTube and all kinds of stuff that, Mm -hmm. you know, I guess the three of us didn't have when we all started playing, but no, I, I do think, yeah, most people, it's encouraging to hear that there you can reach your level as a player and as a professional without having to go through like the traditional sort of education background and all that kind of stuff, you know? 
Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like the, the one, the one thing that's, well, obviously there's a lot of differences between from, you know, now and, and back then on how people, you know, get information and how they learn and all that. Um, but I do think that, you know, something about getting a guitar magazine or a, or a, a book with tablature and, or just chord diagrams and all that. Um, there's something about listening to something over and over. And, you know, if you're reading tab or even if you're playing by ear and just trying to match what you're hearing, you know, and sort of, you, you know, I remember getting so frustrated because I couldn't do something. My dad would be like, just put the guitar on the stand, you know, go outside and play some basketball, I'll come back to it, you know? And I would do yeah. that and dude, I come back and I'd be processing all of it at the time I'm like out, you know, being a kid outside yeah. playing basketball, I'll come back and boy, you know, I nail it that first time coming back, boom, you know? Um, so I, I think like now we just, it's just so different. You just go on YouTube and you, and you learn something, but it's like the feel maybe isn't there. And you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and people are just, they're learning these little bits, like these just like minute long bits of soloing or whatever it is. And, um, all I wanted to do when I started playing guitar was learn the romantics, what I like about you. I swear <laughs> to God, that was like, I just wanted to play that riff. And I, I just figured out the proper way to play it like a year ago. <laughs> you know, you probably I played it. Like, well, I played I it, it all. The, you know, I yeah. played it like F C F. That was completely wrong. You know, um, yeah. but that was, I was just trying to. You know, it was what my ear was telling me to do. Um, and all these years later, I actually figured out all the right inversions and things like that. But um, you know, I, I think to younger players, if I would say anything, is like get out of youtube and tiktok and instagram you know get out of there for a little bit and and use your ear you know mm -hmm. and play along to stuff um and also just rhythm guitar you know i, I i'm this this is a hill for me yeah it's like mm -hmm. there's rhythm guitar i fear is like almost dying a little bit um maybe not dying but it's people learning it is uh it's few fewer people are uh -huh. actually concentrating on learning that to begin their guitar journey with and that's like it's the bedrock for mm -hmm. everything like rhythm you know chords and playing with feel you know with a band and other people like that is do that first you know because then when you when you get out of that and you start soloing and learning all that stuff you know, you need to have rhythm to your solos, you know, <laughs> you yeah. got to have pocket and feel to that too. So, um, that's a big one for me. Preaching the gospel, man. <laughs> I don't want to get too preachy. <laughs> no, that's, that's perfect. You know, cause you're right. I think a lot of it gets lost with, you know, cause Instagram and things like that are all about just performing and like trying to, to, you know, cram as much as you can into a 60 or 90 second clip. And I can imagine if I grew up watching that and that was my exposure to guitar, thinking that that's what you had to do, but you're right. Especially if you want to play, you want to play in bands, you want to do any of that stuff. It's rhythm is 90, 95% of what you're going to do on any given gig at any given time. So it's super important. It, it, it's so important. And it's actually hard, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, when, when I, I work with younger artists, say I'm doing some producing and stuff and you know, it's the feel is not quite there. It's like, you know, it's hard. It's and so it's it's something that that um um you know I just want to remind folks players out there to to still make that a part of your journey playing the guitar. Yeah, yeah I, I think it, it's definitely something most people overlook too. You know, because you, you could dive in. You know, that Hendrix book. You know, because I did the same thing, uh, buying all the tab books, learning all the lead parts, and then you actually listen to like his rhythm playing and how complex and interesting it was. Oh yeah, it. it, it it totally like flipped me on my head when I was, you know, like 17, 16 that, Oh, like that is what makes the song actually listenable. It's not these blistering solos, you know? Yeah. Castles made of sand. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is rhythm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and cool chords and he's singing over the top of it too. Yeah. 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 I, I ran into that trying to learn how to play angel like that. Oh yeah. Those voicings and everything he's doing and then playing the way he is while also singing and everything's in the pocket it's you know uh, uh, yeah 
it's uh it's so it's so important so um yeah man okay so i want to talk a little bit about the uh the recording process you guys have a new album coming out right yes it's called weather veins it comes out june 9th nice so you guys uh tell me about this process where did you cut it and and how long did it take you know all that kind of stuff we recorded it at blackbird studios over there in Berry Hill, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and I, I was July of last year we recorded it, which is like, wow. But, you know, it takes takes a while now, especially for an independent operation like us, to get vinyl press and all that. Um, so, yeah, it was July of last year, and Jason produced it this time, which was, which was different but very fun and cool. Um, and we all had a really good time. Um, Let's see how long did it take? I think I don't know. Probably uh we always have about three weeks mapped out for recording and that's with weekends off. Yeah. So, you know, fifteen days. Um and I think the band we recorded I think we we every song we recorded ended up being on the record. I think it's like thirteen songs. Mm-hmm. Um so that was that was about I guess over ten days. You know, maybe eight, something like that. Are you, as as a guitar player, are you going into a session like that, having all your parts mapped out? Like you guys have been in rehearsal for a few weeks and you're going in, or is it you've got the so- the song structure, Jason has sent you a few demos, or or you've been playing it live for a while and you're, you're writing parts in the studio? We don't hear anything before we go to the studio. Never. Nice. Well. Um, nice. And honestly, a lot of things I end up producing... It's the same way. No one hears anything <laughs> before they go in. This is like, get there. Um, you know, the artist plays a song, you write a chart out, and you go out there and just start figuring out your, your parts and things like that. I guess it is like the very Nashville way to do things. Um, I haven't experienced too much of the other way, so I don't know if it's better or worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess it's it's case by case. But in our situation, I think... I'm not sure why we do it that way, but um, it's it's pretty normalized for us. So yeah. we don't hear anything until, um, actually this this time around, he did send a song to us while we were on the road and was like, "Hey, start messing around with this. Maybe it's sound check and just kind of start messing around." So there was one song that we had heard before, but nothing really developed until we got to the studio. Um, so he, you know, Jason will we get there, he'll grab an acoustic guitar. He'll sit on the couch. He'll play us a song while he's looking in his lyric book. And we make charts. Maybe I have a guitar. Maybe I'm kind of, you know, as it's going down, find something. And then he stops and um, we're all like, all right, cool. And then he'll say to me, I'm going to play the da da guitar. Right. right? He'll tell me. And then I'll go, <laughs> okay, well, I guess I'll... <laughs> I'll play the Telecaster guitar, you know, or whatever. But he'll, you know, and his, he's already got what he's going to do. He's a fantastic guitarist and he's the artist. So he is like, I'm going to do this with the echo with the, you know what I mean? He's already got in his head what he's going to do. So all I, I just try to find a way to fit in around what he's doing, you know, which is as a session player, I mean, we're in his band, so it's a little different, but if you're going into a session, that's what you should be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, finding your, spot to accent whatever the artist is doing um and you know i'll just try to write a part around him you know and you know i just try to find my my little zone my space right we we had a question from uh, someone on instagram gunner asked about when you're writing lead parts um or parts in general do, do you like try to get really meticulous about it or do you just let it be spur of the moment and let it flow flow out as you're practicing and, and hearing these songs and stuff i i think i'm i'm it, there's like a balance with me like like sometimes i'll play some amazing stuff in my mind amazing like j- just you know tasteful things like when i'm just going for it and i'm like not worried about messing up and it's like first or second time we're running through the song like just going for it you're not even thinking about it. and then sometimes i get some great stuff sometimes i might fall a little short or mess up going for something and then it's like hey can i redo that and just just develop you know i'm finding things that i like as i'm going down mm-hmm. and then you know there's sort of like i feel like there's this 
there's this magic area of like take three, four, you know, if you even get that far, yeah, where something's developed, right? Around take four or five, you're starting to suck because <laughs> you're playing too good. Like it's too, you're just like, well, I've got this perfect part now and it goes <laughs> here and I'm going to do this. And, you know, and it doesn't have like, you know, when you're, when you're, playing just by off of instinct that first or second time you're timing like you know what i mean you're putting things in like interesting spots and that's always like the magic stuff even if you mess up you can go back and fix it and go i like where i put that yeah maybe i need to play it higher or whatever you know a melody thing so i don't get too meticulous um if i'm producing though and it's you know what i mean i i and it, i'm writing a theme you know for a keyboard part or guitar part i'm a little more meticulous about it nice right the thing i love about <clears throat> the the 400 unit and having seen y'all live a couple times it's i think kind of a unique band where there's two really great lead guitarists at, on the same stage at the same time i think that's kind of a rare thing um how do you and jason work together like in terms of sound and tone, are you guys like in rehearsal? Are you talking about, Hey, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to run the SG through the Vox on this song. Maybe you should go telly through the the Fender or whatever, or is it just kind of like you're playing whatever you want and you've been playing together for a long time. So you just kind of know where each other's going to go. Um, so, so we'd never rehearse. Um, I mean, never, of course we tour, all, we tour a lot. So, Okay. We have sound check every day. You know what I mean? So it's like, um, but we on only rehearse every two years or so when we're about to put a record. Like <laughs> basically, shit. we're gonna like, and, and this this is real. I'm I'm not making this up. Like, like we haven't rehearsed since um, October 2020. <laughs> okay. Wow. So <laughs> that's, so that's wild. We, yeah. <laughs> so we'll rehearse in june three days before we leave for tour right right and um so we'll be doing the new songs and you know i just i, I mainly defer to him what he's gonna play right right and then usually on tour after we've been playing for a while i mean you know jason's like pretty much a collector at this point like guitars and all like that. So, so like he'll get a new guitar he'll be playing it on you know he got a telly the other day's playing it on a song i already play it till like i don't really change my thing once yeah, i yeah. figure you know but he he will change his stuff a good bit um but you know he's playing through different amps than me so if we're both playing a telly it's gonna sound it'll sound different because he's playing through more of a fender thing and i'm playing through a vox marshall thing or whatever you know i'm more of the british you know the american amps and stuff like that i love them but that's my tone is more Vox Marshall, you know? So, um, I think it actually, it works great against each other, you know? Yeah. Um, it's just wide and, and you know, the, the spaces are filled up harmonically. Yeah. So what are you using? What, what is your, your rig live? Um, it's the same amp I've been using for 10 years. It's a third power British dream. It's got a Celestian Gold speaker in it. And then behind it, I have a Vox Pacemaker that's all tube. It's the tube version. And it's yeah. from 1965 that I found in Seattle. Um, that's it. Those are just the two amps. I don't change. I am <laughs> they're, like, they're I'm not really all a the time. They're both on all the time. And the, and the third power has the Vox side and the Marshall side. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, I'm kicking, you know, if it's a rock song throughout, I'm on the Marshall. Yeah. With a telly or Les Paul or whatever. Um, and then everywhere else I'm on the Vox side, but I'll kick on the Marshall for chorus or whatever, you know, just to you bring it up a notch. So I'm, I'm using it, the amp is like a boost, but I'm changing amps. I'm changing within the same amp. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like having a Vox and a Marshall share the same speaker, but I'm like, you know, I'm not hitting a boost pedal. I'm just cranking into the Marshall side nice I, I think a lot of people might not know about third power because they're they're a nashville based company and um they're they make 
killer stuff. The woolly coats, if you are into the the yeah. Fender thing, is remarkable. But yeah, the the British Dream and all their stuff is is so good. Yeah, and it's it's honestly, I feel like, um, it, it's kind of my sound you know for me like i don't like when i play i I play through plenty of other stuff at home and in the studio um but i you know i'm just it it feels like when i'm playing through that amp i'm like okay i'm home you Mm -hmm. know what i mean i'm i'm kind of scared to like i just don't like changing things too too much but i'm happy with my tone i guess that's the thing like i'm not really like i'm not looking for i like it so I'm yeah. not, I'm not like, I need <laughs> another broke, pedal man. or I need another amp. Oh my God. I'm not, uh, my tone sucks or whatever. <laughs> just like, that's good. Yeah. It sounds good. So uh, in terms of pedals, like, are you relying on anything on the floor in front of you for extra gain staging or boost or fuzz or anything, or it's all amp? It's mostly all amp, but like for, for solos, um, I have a king of tone. So the boot, I use the yellow side as like a cleaner boost. And then I use the red side for, you know, the red side mm-hmm. for hairy, you know, big red rock side. solo stuff. Yeah, red side. Red side and uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yellow, red, you know. <laughs> what, yeah, what else do you need, man? You get yeah, it. it's fun. Clean, dirty. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, let's see, what else do I have? I did get a new pedal. Um, I have like a what I call my flex spot on my pedal board, which... Uh-huh that's where i can try different stuff you know um and i have a it's it's made by nordvang or nordvang it's mm-hmm. it's uh they're danish they're uh-huh. from copenhagen yeah and um it is called the uh the, the I, don't know what, I don't know what it's called um <laughs> let me <laughs> I'm sorry. I You're going to be getting so called. many questions about it in the comments. <laughs> is it is we it their um, ODR one thing? Um, I'll I'll tell you. Um, I'm sorry. This is dead air. This is terrible. No, well, we can. Oh, oh, oh! They do all like the the like John Mayer inspired things. What's it called? Things. Oh, here it is. Um, number one signature. It's called the number one signature. And um, it's a clon. No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> Whoa. No, but well, it's, no, like a, it, 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 it's like a, it's like a, you minute. know, it's just a real nice drive pedal that has some good mid range. It gets pretty squishy and, um, you know, it kind of reminds me of the camel toe a little bit, I'd okay. say, the way yeah. I have it set. So it's just got that nice, I don't know, man, just, just, it's a great. For 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 leads, it's yeah. just great. It's it gets kind of honky. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, um, but uh, you know, I don't. Th- I mean, I don't think it's like a really popular pedal. Um, but They're a pretty uh, small company. Well, now yeah. it's about to be. Thanks, Sadler. Now no one can get them. They're not. They, he hasn't made like a ton of them. You know, and yeah. uh, I went. There's this guitar store in Oslo um that i always go into called vintage guitar and um they're just like real sweet dudes in there and i always try to stop in there um because they're big fans of the band and you know they have a cool store and so i stopped in there and and the guy was like just try this pedal out you know and i was like man i'm gonna i'm gonna buy this i don't want to come in here and like not buy anything yeah 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 the the dollar was strong and uh so i (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so it's like yeah i'm gonna get this thing and so, i like it i like it a lot i actually did need a pedal for i was running a um marshall blues breaker uh-huh. as my back line i had like a hand-wired ac30 and a blues breaker i didn't have an attenuator for the blues breaker so i kind of ne- i needed Ooh. you know what i mean so i put it in front i really needed something and i was like well this will be perfect so i put it in front of that so i could get some crunch but you know what i'm talking about lower yeah. level yeah yeah so that's an interesting question. You brought up uh, the the store. You said Vintage Guitar in Oslo. You guys, you, you travel a lot. You're on tour all the time, all over the world. What are some some guitar stores that you've been to like that, that stick out to you that whenever you're in that city, that area, that you're like, I got to go. I got to go check this place out. Huh. Um, you know, I th- it's mainly... The, you know that's that's one that i don't think a lot of people have heard of 
um, if you're not going to Norway on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, but you know, it's it's kind of the the stuff that everyone knows about now. You know, like a uh, guitar house in Tulsa. You know, is a, is a really cool shop. Um, I always go to Chicago Music Exchange when I'm in Chicago because they're just they're great folks and um you know they'll they'll have some stuff you know to to look at and uh check out and um I'm trying to think though i definitely am, am probably missing have you ever been to um it's just outside of dc action music do you know that place no okay that was one we we stumbled in there like i i needed a pack of strings or something and we just googled this place we were uh-huh. in vienna virginia and we just rolled in oh cool one of the coolest guitar shops i've ever been to it still still stands out so oh man i'd love to check that out yeah we're always like when we're playing dc now we're like a wolf trap Mm -hmm. um which is that in vienna actually uh it might be it's outside dc but yeah yeah um well next time we play wolf trap i'll have to go go check it out man yeah go check him out kevin o'connor on instagram had a question is your sunburst sg still your number one so it's actually it's actually brown. It's like brown burst or something. I don't even know what the color is called. Uh, I got it at Martin Music in Memphis mm-hmm. years ago. It's a 2005, um, and I put my favorite Seymour Duncan combination in there. I have the 59 and the neck and pearly gates and the bridge. I just love the way those two pick up sound. I know they're wax potted and I know all that stuff, but I like the way they sound. <laughs> they sound good. Who cares? Um, and... Uh, yeah, yeah, I still it's still my number one favorite guitar, you know. Um but uh you know, I've I've bought some more guitars since having just that one. Um and you know, I try to mix it up against Jason's guitars live. So, um but that's this is definitely still my number one and once again with my third power I equate it to my tone, you know. Yeah. Mhm. Right. Nice. Um Trying oh, to find shit. more interesting questions. Well, uh, I have. I, go ahead. If you go ahead. No, up. you got it. Right. Go. Okay. Go. All right. So uh, another question came on Instagram. So mid TN Music Man, if Oasis reunites, what's the over under on how many shows you will attend? <laughs> uh, well, I'd like to. I, I'd like to attend. You know, two. That would be awesome if I could see two. You know, it's hard for me to go to shows with with. Uh, with touring a lot, you know, yeah. and then when I'm home, it's not like I'm taking off to go see shows, but for Oasis, I'd, I would make it happen. Um, you know, I think they're going to, I think they're going to do it. I think, uh, Noel just got divorced. You know, I think it's time for a reunion. You know, you're going to need that money. You think, you know, I, so need that seriously, money. you think it's, it's happening? Cause I've seen you pause it it's on gonna Twitter happen. quite a bit. Like it's, you know, it did, you know, it kind of became a thing for me. Like, they're not my favorite band. Like, some people think, like, they're my favorite band. They're actually not my favorite band. They're one of my favorite bands. I love Oasis, you know, but they're not, like, the Who's my favorite band of all time, you know? Um, but it became a thing. Like, I don't even really care that that much, <laughs> but it's kind of just fun, you know, to to talk about. And it's become part of my throw up in my mouth brand a little bit on Twitter. Uh, just, you know, it's just it's just fun and some people hate it too which is really funny to me <laughs> they get so mad <laughs> when i post it or like they hate oasis or whatever but you know i just think like i remember seeing them in 2005 in atlanta um and you know i i just think like we're we're missing a rock band that has songs that are just so that big yeah you know uh the, not even popularity big just big these songs are just so big and when you see it live it's just loud and it's they have this attitude like it or not they're just fucking rock stars i mean they're i feel like yeah. they're like the last ones you know even though they don't dance around the stage like Mick Jagger or you know they don't really move a whole lot but they develop their own thing with that you know, just the, the standing there, the iconic thing that they have and just the history of the brothers and the reality show that still going on with them. I mean, they've maintained relevancy, you know, not even putting music out 
for the last yeah they're not even yeah. together and they're still <coughs> they're still 15 years or whatever yeah and they're still talked about all the time i, I saw it was uh i guess the lead singer of the the 1975 yes saw tiktok of him uh talking about like how unbelievably stupid he thinks that it is that they're not together it's like they're the coolest band in the world how could you not be together playing these songs out live but i yeah. like when he said there's not one person at a Noel Gallagher show or a Liam Gallagher show that wouldn't rather be in an Oasis show. Not yep. one person. And I yep. think he's absolutely right. 100%. Without a doubt. Yeah. That that hit home with me. But, you know, we'll see what happens. I would just love to see some loud ass British rock music. Yeah. <laughs> in an arena. You know? How fun would that be? <laughs> I think you're kinda right, man. It's like I there aren't many bands. Doing name that. one. Yeah. You can't. A loud British rock band playing amps on stage in arenas. Coldplay is not one. No. <laughs> I like Coldplay, but they're, they're not that, you yeah. know? And, no. uh, you know, U2 is U2. I mean, they were, they were, that's, they're like classic rock. And I mean, yeah. Oasis is getting, you know, they're pretty much classic rock too, but you know what I mean? Like U2 is yeah. like, they transcend that. Speaking of U2, you know what I would really love to see? I would really love to see U2. I hope Bono hears this. <laughs> Please subscribe, I would, Bono. He's a fan. He's a fan. Yeah. I would really love to see you two do a tour in arenas, but none of the bullshit production oh, stuff yeah. that they do. Like, mm -hmm. like just a stage with like lights and just like play. Yeah. Just play. Maybe yeah. you got a little catwalk or something, but you that know. That would be amazing. I, I love you two. I saw them on the 360 tour, you know, the giant spaceship stage yes. thing. I guess it was like 2010 or something. They came to Atlanta, played the Georgia Dome. And uh, it was massive. Muse opened for them, which was incredible. Ooh. But I, I agree. It's like there's you two, the the sort of spectacle. But, dude, I mean, I guess they, they did the Joshua Tree record <coughs> a few years ago. They did that tour, which I missed, unfortunately. But, yeah, it's like play you know the unforgettable fire or joshua tree or war and just stage amps on stage yeah simple setup and just play, just the play songs. everything just play all your hits just play you know no albums front to back just just play your <laughs> songs just play all your songs <laughs> on a stage just you know simple yeah you know what yeah. i mean i would love to see a youtube show like that it makes sense that you would say that, you know, because because your band, I mean, that's basically what you guys do. And I saw y'all here in Atlanta uh, last December at the Tabernacle. Y'all did a couple shows and it was so refreshing to see a show at a at a big venue like that where it was just a band on stage with amps and mm -hmm. drums and and nothing, no tracks, no, no, you know. Ableton that you and know all this of. stuff. No, I'm well. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally oh, shit, kidding. Dude, we got yeah. the scoop. <laughs> they're they're running pitch correction. On <laughs> um, no, it was just it's it's great. Like to me, it highlights the fact that you're not hiding behind anything, and you're you're putting the songs and the playing out front because that's all you need to do. Because both the songs <clears throat> and the musicianship on stage in that band. Um, I'm a huge fan if you can't tell, but it's, it was just refreshing to see. So it makes sense that you would want to see that out of a band like you too. Well, and, and, and thanks for, for those compliments, Rhett. I mean, I think my wife has never seen you too. She's not even really that big of a fan or even a fan of you too. And I want to, I want her to see you too, but I'm like, I can't just like, I want her just, you know, I want her just to see a normal concert by them right right it's like now they're doing the dome thing or whatever and i'm like you're gonna go in there and it's like gonna be like this immersive like whatever i'm just like i just want a fucking rock show from you yeah. just you know what i mean like yeah <laughs> i do know i know they're mean. always pushing the you know and and uh i know they're always like pushing the envelope or whatever um you know for production and new things and all that but you know um it's like I don't want my wife's like first U two show to be like in this dome where she's surrounded by a screen and like Bono's like you know whatever three sixty reality audio I don't know I don't know what's going on I just want to see the rock. <laughs> we did get asked on Instagram by James, what's the best show you've been to or seen? <clears throat> Prince. 
Uh, I got to see Prince okay. twice. Um, I got to see him in Madison Square Garden, and I got to see him. It's funny. Drove all the way to New York City to see Prince from Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, it was a blizzard had just happened. All, all I had was like Chuck Taylors on and like just young and dumb and didn't wasn't prepared at all. But we saw Prince and it was great. Two months later, and if you know anything about Prince, he used to do this thing where he would just like announce a show two weeks before the show. Right. He would do stuff. He would do different stuff like that all the time. So like two months later, I'm reading the paper and it's like Prince is coming to Charleston. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, I just drove to New York <laughs> to see you. And now you're just, you're coming to Charleston. It was like in, a, in two weeks from that yeah. announcement. And so I ended up getting tickets and, and went again. And it was a completely different show. And, uh, you know, just as great. So, you know, that's probably in terms of just like performance and everything. It's probably the best show. Um, performance and showmanship and just, you know the amount of great songs he has and um that was probably it but you know i've seen the who a ton of times and they always put on an amazing show um you know i've seen um seen the stones a few times um you know when i saw the foo fighters a couple years ago i thought that was a really really great like like you know big rock show they put on a great show yeah. Um, yeah. Well, nice. awesome. Well, do we want to get into dipping a rig? I think I think it's time. Okay. <laughs> well, I've got it pulled up here. So this is uh, <clears throat> his username. Just says Hugh uh, Hugh ESB. Right. So I don't know if he has telepathic abilities or not. But here is his his setup. Um, Ooh. So we mm. got uh, an ES three thirty three. Uh, a SG standard with P90s and then a custom shop no caster plugged into a 63 baseman mm. that he's uh, changes the Tolex to black and a um, wow, just a mojo tone two by 10 cab and the pedals super simple. He's got uh, uh, an MVP, oh, an Ernie Ball volume pedal, TS10, a electro harmonics. Uh, Pulsar Tremolo Boss CE2, a vintage Deluxe Memory Man, and uh, just a two. Oh, wow. and a vintage, vintage CE2. I don't know if I said that, but yeah. Then, I mean, this is like, this is I pretty don't know. Heavy. This is really good. This is this really is, good. This is pretty heavy. So, what do you guys uh, think? Man. All right. Well, we got to start with the guitars. That's, wow. that is a, uh, that's, that's quite the selection of guitars. That's ticking all the boxes for me right there. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, yeah. The, I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's it's good. It's very good. Um, yeah, start with guitars. Go ahead, Rhett. Well, so the, you said three thirty three. Yeah, so a three thirty three was a budget three thirty five. Mm, okay. um, they didn't have a pick guard, and they have a, a backplate, so you can actually work on the electronics. Oh. Um, it, but like, there's no like mother of pearl Gibson on the headstock or inlay or anything on the headstock, and just dots. Really simple, but they're they're cool guitars, and a lot of people buy them and mod them out um because you can actually do it without you know wanting to kill yourself yeah so really cool guitars yeah the back plate <laughs> maybe i'll mod my 335 and put a back plate on it there you go um, yeah great great idea yeah i mean that's that's great and then the sg with the bigsby i wonder the bigsby probably serves two functions there if if it's an sg that neck dives it's probably helping to balance out the neck dive yeah um and then the no caster i mean Dude, there's nothing there that I would add or change, honestly. <clears throat> yeah. So if you're gigging, um, as much as I love those memory mans, you know, they're temperamental though. And if you're at a gig and that thing starts, you know, so just, you know, just being a realist here, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. you might want to look at just a more reliable, you know, digital I wonder, delay. I mean, I, I mean, you know, just, just, just you he, know powering that like on the power supply onto the board because that one's got the plug right that's got the the hard the plug cable. yeah the hard some wire do um some of them i don't know they you know they have nothing the beats the sound of a memory man though i'm just gonna i'm uh, just 100 you know 
do you think there's something to the the ones with the internal power supply though like having the power transformer in the box sounding uh, different they're, they're than noisier because the... <laughs> there's a transformer in yeah that, dude but that's better <laughs> though you want box. that though. you got that transformer in there dude yeah let me tell you something <laughs> mic'd up had a gig going through whatever mic whatever cable whatever console through the speakers into the room reflection of the room or even now in the studio through the thing through the digital shit into the other digital shit out <laughs> through the analog back into the digital shit who gives a shit <laughs> Oh God, that's a that's a dipped in tone all time it. quote right there. It's a Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. I'm just movie. saying, if we're not thinking about this, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. But Sadler, what are what are people going to argue about on the gear page if we don't? Yeah, I know. we need to talk about why that I, TS10 is obviously better than any other tube. Oh, I definitely, I definitely don't want to take that away from anyone arguing on the, on the gear page. You know, like, <laughs> no, I don't think you have to worry about that. They, they'll find plenty to argue about. So, so okay, well, the, uh, also like, uh, okay, the basement, like it's pretty loud. It's pretty loud. Uh, and so yeah. what do you got? Two ten. Yeah. Well. So, so what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing for that to help your brothers out on stage? You know? So <sighs> I'm just trying to poke holes. It's hard. I can't really find anything wrong with this. Rig. This, I, this is, is great, a really right? good one. This is, this is a hard around, one. Right. To, yeah, if it's a closed back cab, just turn the cab around, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, but... who want, no. Who wants to do that? Don't, don't turn the cab around. No. <laughs> Dude, just, just get start... a little something. Just get a little, a, you know, attenuator or something. Honestly, you know? honestly, if your stage volume is not obscene, just start saying no. Just say when when the front of house, hey, could you turn yes, down a little yes. bit? Just be like, no, I can't. Right, right. I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't. Like, you just tap not... your foot on that volume pedal a little you bit. You know what I? You know what I do reason. a lot. You know what I do a lot though? I'll have well, of course, you know, I've got, you know, Dave Brown, my guitar tech. But I'll have him play. And I will I mean, I I do this almost every day. I go out and I sit in the first, you know, in a theater wherever we're playing. Yep. I go out there and make sure that thing's not taking somebody's head off. Oh yeah. Mm. Because it's going to sound better for yeah. them. Right. You know what I mean? And and um you're going to get it from the PA and Man, it's so nice when you see a band that just is, you know, even if you're like up close, you know, that, that it's it's so balanced. Yeah. You know, on stage. It's it's nice. Yeah, there's you're right, like a, having a balanced, but what I have seen, I think, and and heard about more is like it seems that front of house engineers and artists and people want like basically no stage volume and they mm -hmm. want you to turn down <clears throat> to just as quiet as possible. So it's like there's there's a there's a Goldilocks zone there where you're you gotta move air. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're getting the guitar and the amp to work together, you know, but yep. you're not ripping somebody's head off four yep. rows back. Yeah, but I think this uh, would be a good rig for that because it's it's two tens. Yeah, so, it probably breaks up, you know. Yeah, pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, great rig. I give watts. this uh, uh, a, yeah, a basement, a vintage basement. They're like yeah, thirty-five well, to forty or so. They're not super okay. loud. Yeah, but, okay. but he says he's not running it with a lot of drive. Um, okay. So, like, I mean, I think just as a push clean sound, like, you're gonna get that pretty quick on the the volume pod on a vintage yeah. basement. I'd, so it, you know, I don't prefer the black face uh, basement. I like the uh, the blondes better. But well, this was a, me. this is a '63, so it was originally a blonde that someone oh, okay. spray painted it black. He said, "Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, man, I missed that detail." <laughs> All right, so, sweet. I mean, I mean those so, those yeah. break up really Never well. Never mind, I like it. <laughs> I so typically I Sadler I'm I'm not a tube screamer guy like at, at all I don't yeah do, I'm not either the, the tube screamer uh -oh. thank you Th okay can we talk about why don't you like tube screamers I mean I used to have one but I just I just I don't I don't know I don't like that oh thank God <laughs> Jesus I get so <laughs> I, much I'm shit. bad at articulating why I don't like <clears throat> something like okay but look look in in uh people's defense who like tube screamers like zach likes tube screamers i don't remember which one i have i've only had one and i don't even remember like the what they're all the what, same okay <laughs> they're just too same. like tubey sounding they're too yes you know it's, it's like too much mid-range yeah it's find. like it's like <clears throat> it's like uh too saturated for me like i honestly don't like a lot of saturation 
I don't, I really just don't. I just, I just, uh, as I, as I get older, I'm just, I'm getting cleaner and cleaner, but I'm always looking for that perfect amount of, of, you know, clean ish. Right. It's like, it's like, like just that, that perfect spot of, of breakup where when you're playing a solo, it's just like, it's just that Mike Campbell thing. You know, he's one of my, he's one of my heroes. And just that, like, just that, it's clean, but it's not. Yes. <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? That to yes. me is like the the perfect thing. I guess if I'm, I'm happy with my tone, but if I'm always in search of something, it's, I'm always adjusting like volume and the mm-hmm. amount of right. preamp, you know, uh, drive and stuff on my amp. That That's what I'm always messing with, you know, from, from day to day, room to room just you know i want to be able to play these nice like cleanish chords and stuff but mm-hmm. then if i do a lick i've got enough uh sustain and and you know um well it you know, sounds it's bigger through yeah it yes. sounds bigger in the context of bigger. the band it sounds because bigger. it's not as compressed so you have right. like the the notes can can bloom and cl- oh, god you're preaching the gospel here man well and i and like them at, you know <laughs> Well, hey, I'm a big. I love Trey Anastasio, man. I mean, you know, well, I, he's a, he's a tube screamer. He's a tube screamer guy, and yeah, uh, he he I, stacks I mean, So Rhett, Rhett always argues that it, you know it's, they're they're only for giving a mid boost to a black panel um, style amp, which is what yes. Hugh is using. He uses this for a mid bump, but right. I don't know. I because I like a lot of you know uh, like Les Paul into Marshall, and I know that. I, don't, I never use a screamer as like a gain pedal per se, mm, okay. but I like how it tightens up the low end and cuts the lows and gives the mids a push because I run pretty bright because that was the thing when I worked at, at Carter Vintage Drink. Drink. Everyone would, uh, all the, the, the old guard would say, hey, you know how to set up a Marshall is you dime the treble and you dime the mids and then you dump the bass. Right. And like that was the sound and I started doing that with all mine and then when you hit it with this, it just sounds like Thin Lizzy or something. I, I like that. So, so yeah, I love yeah. Thin Lizzy. Yeah. I mean, I, the, I, and I, I have a, I got a real plexi last year and I have that set up right now. Um, but I also, I don't like the volumes dimed on Marshall's though. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I actually, yeah. I actually like, you know, I feel like, when people are trying to do like ACDC sounds, they always add too much. It's too mm-hmm. saturated. 100%. And it's like, yep. they forget that Malcolm and Angus together make that sound. Yep. Yep. So yeah. So individually, their tones are cleaner than you think. Yes. They're just loud, you know, Super they're, loud. They're, you know what I mean? It, it, and, and it's, and so they're not banging hard on the guitar, right. you know, but it's like, you know, Malcolm's playing a Gretsch, Angus is playing an SG, they're pan hard left and right. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's why you like that tone. It sounds bigger and people think bigger means more drive or, yep. you know, diamond your, your Marshall or whatever, but that's not how you get that sound. Yeah, no. Play better. And that's a great Man. sound. Like if you want Guns N' Roses. Sure. You know what right. I mean? Neck pick up on Les Paul, diamond out, dump the bass, boom. Guns and Roses, yeah. <laughs> Bingo Bongo, you're there. You're there. Well, I, well let's I, let's wrap up this rig dip, and then we'll. <laughs> okay. I just I just have to say I think so we're, I will we're go both, on a tear. Yeah. Well, you and I I think are both um, followers of the Church of Our Lord and Savior Mike Campbell in that, uh, respect. <laughs> I love Mike Campbell. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just. What's okay, your problem well, with Campbell, Zach? Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I like two You like Tom Petty? That, My God, like, <laughs> I love Tom Petty. <laughs> <laughs> I'll okay. say like like okay. I'm, Wrap up the tube screamer thing and we'll move on. It's been so long since I've owned a tube screamer and played through one. Come by the shop. Okay. And I'll, and, yeah. I'll get all these. I got they so haven't many. changed, you can just take Siler, They all still sound the same. I don't know. I'm sure they suck. They, look, there's two good ways to use a tube screamer, in my opinion. One is is this way with a, a mid-scooped amp where you're replacing the mid-range, right? Uh-huh. Or I like that. <clears throat> big amp, ton of gain. You need to tighten up the low end. Otherwise, yeah. don't don't put a tube screamer on your board. Yeah. Okay. Also, they all sound the same. The TS-10, it- they all that stuff sounds the same. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I agree with that. <laughs> so the only thing about this rig I would change is the volume pedal. I mean, that's, if anyone's owned a VP Junior, you know they're disposable. Um, not just the string yeah. breaks, but everything breaks on them. Everything breaks. Yeah. 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 Um, 
And also, do you need a volume pedal? I used to run a volume pedal religiously, and then I broke one and didn't buy another one. And I figured out, actually, I don't need this for yeah. anything. That's funny. I, I have a volume pedal on like every one of my boards. Um, I don't even really know why. I, oh, so, well, you know, I, I cut it out, you know, in between a song or, or whatever, to tune or send it to the tuner. Or, you sure. know, every once in a while, I'll do a, a swell or something. But I use my volume knob a lot, too. So, yeah, I mean, I don't. Yeah. He, he says this one, actually, it's an active one. So when it's toe down, uh, he gets about a 6 dB boost. So it's it can uh, go okay. a little okay. clean boost. So, right, I mean, cool. like, I don't know. I kind of get it for, like, a simple rig like this. Because if you're wanting that amp to do the all the heavy lifting of the gain – then you can, you know, if you're not comfortable mm-hmm. riding your volume pot. And then, like, I guess, too, if you're using different guitars, like you're switching a lot, the taper on all the volume pots might be a little different. And if you need that consistency, I could understand using. And don't know, discount the location of the volume pots are different on all these guitars, too. So yeah. if you're switching, like, the to, to ride a volume swell on a 335 is not easy. So oh, you yeah. got a yeah. long way. Yeah, you got to go. get down there. I would say, so Red's going to change the volume pedal. I'm stuck between, you know, just for, for gig, I'm just thinking gigging, Uh um, maybe, maybe a different delay just, just so you don't have to worry about something going down. And that's a very realist thing. That's a very boring thing. I know that's not, that's not hip and cool at all, but I'm, 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 yeah, I'm not. And, (laughs) and I, I'm stuck between that and the Bigsby because as much as Uh Bigsby's look cool, I mean, you know, you ass. weighing on that thing. If you don't have like, and, and I don't know, maybe he has the, um, what you call it? The, uh, the bridge the from, vibro, um, vibromate or whatever. No, the, um, the master was a uh, master bridge or uh, mastery? Uh, mastery bridge. I uh-huh. don't know if he has that there, but it doesn't look like it. No, um, no. I mean, you weighing on that thing, dude, it's SG, you know, it's you're, you're out of 10. They're so also I, such a pain in the ass to restring too. They're restring. And then also, um, I know the the what are they the liar l y r e those mm-hmm. are supposed to be really great on there so maybe maybe switch that out. All right, what's your rating? <laughs> um, go, you know, eight point four shoals. Yeah. All right, yeah, you like that? That's yeah. that really <laughs> good. <laughs> Man, I'm not far off. I think I think ditch the volume pedal. I agree with the Bigsby. It looks cool. Probably would not use it. Mm. And the Memory Man. I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I kind of appreciate like the danger element of, of like taking that thing out on a gig. So, um, and also, you know, the tube screamer, I get it on this board. I, I I'll allow it. I'm going to give it a 9.4. Dang. Cool. Wow. I wow. like that. I like all of this. Uh, I would keep the. I would get. I would. The only thing I would do is probably put another tube screamer on it. So yeah, yeah. I'll give it a 9.5. I forgot about that curly cord, man. No, nah, that's not yeah. going to work. That's not going to work at the gig. Oh, you don't like the coily cable? No, that's not. They're, no. Well, there's such high capacitance. They suck a lot of trouble. Anyway. All hey, right. Man. I gave we my rating. It. We did it. <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> we should, so, we'll do a whole other episode just on coily cables then, it sounds like. I think the last two questions we should ask, uh, they, they're from Instagram as well. Okay. From John and Kyle. How do you rip so hard, and why are you so cool? That that was that was two questions that that I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> how do I wait? How do you rip so hard? How am I so, so cool, hard? and why do you rip so hard? <laughs> <laughs> different different questions. How I nah. how do I rip so hard? Um, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, um, I mean, look, I'll say this about myself. I like like. I'm a fairly nice person, but I do have a little killer instinct. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I've got a little, when I'm on stage, well, not darkness, but, but I mean, I'm ready to go, Yeah. you know, but I'm also like, like, you know, I example, my, my buddy, I I did some guitar tracks for a friend of mine like two days ago. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing was like, you know, just pretty straight up. The other thing was like, okay, slide guitar, like throughout, like lead slide. I'm like, okay, cool. And, um, I was like, can I get this to you Monday though? I gotta go get my kid from daycare. And he's like, just, just do it. You could do it. Just 10 minutes. Just like do it. And I've known the producer for a long time. I'm like, all right. 
and I did it, and I was like pretty happy with it. Actually, I was like, yeah, that's, yeah, that was great. Work. That's fine. Yeah, and uh, he came back and was like. It's good, but I, I kind of want I want more, you know. I want more, and I'm like, okay, all right, yeah. I was just trying to leave some space and all that stuff. He's like, no, I I love that about you. I love that's your first, you know what I mean? And he's like, yeah. I love that that's your first, you know, way of go. You know, my first thing isn't like whip it out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know guys that are that way, and that's a way, and that's fine. <laughs> I'm not that way though, but. You know, I, I'm just, I guess I'm just playing into whatever the situation is, you know, and yep. we'll, we'll talk about our, the band that I'm in. Like, you know, there's a few different ways to handle when Jason's playing a solo first, which usually happens. If we both have a solo and a song, he goes first, typically. Right. Don't think there's a rhyme or reason, but that's just kind of how it works. He goes first and, you know, he Jason kind of comes out. He comes out the gate playing some great stuff usually uh -huh. like and it's and and you know it, it's his style um and so sometimes i just got to figure out like how to answer that you know am i gonna feel like if he plays a lot of notes during the solo am i gonna fill it up with a lot of notes too or am i gonna try to play the slowest guitar solo in the world uh-huh yeah. <laughs> you know that's the choice like it, you know so it just depends like Sometimes like he's like really, you know, going for it. Like he's, you know, and, uh, and sometimes I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to fucking dig in yeah. here. All right. Yeah. You know? And so, and then sometimes I'm like, okay, you know, he did that version. So I'm going to do this, right. this version so that it's just, you know, different. Um, you're just giving, you're giving the listeners something different, but, um, I guess uh, I like ripping hard, though, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. But yeah. I'm not a fan of, like, Shredder. I, I I didn't grow up listening to even Halen and all that kind of stuff, like, hard rippers. That came really later for me. Yeah. You know? And I never really learned to tap and all that kind of stuff. Like, I just, you know, I, I guess I've never, I've always been more concerned with, like, what someone's playing rather than how it sounds. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. I know we're on dipped in tone, but, like, I've that's kind of my thing is, like, what? someone's playing rather than listen to that tone you know i'm kind of yeah. like i the notes speak to me more than what the sound i mean it depends sometimes the sound speaks more to me but most of the time it's like what someone's playing well it's about mm -hmm. the song right it's like what what what's happening what is the song doing and what is the guitar part how is it adding to the song yes you know just like the attack and when i can like hear the person in the notes yep I can hear like their heart and like whatever, like even if they're mad or they're sad or that to me is like really Im important. Like, mm -hmm. like when George Harrison plays slide, like you hear it's, it's, you know what I mean? It's like, man, it, it, you can hear it. It's, yeah. it's yeah. like kind of sad. Yeah, man. Sadler. It's been great. Thank you so much for coming on. It Thank was you a guys. Blast hanging out with you. And, uh, yeah, you're welcome back anytime, man. Man, I'd love to do it again. Thank you guys for having me, and, and uh, yeah. thanks everybody for the questions. And um, yeah, come see us on the road. Before before you go, anything upcoming with you? I know, like you had your studio record, your solo record a couple of years ago. Anything coming up next? I'm hoping to record some more this year. So that's kind of where I'm where I'm at right now. I've been doing a lot of producing, but um, hopefully later this year I can I can get back in the studio. Awesome, nice man. All right, we'll have links and everything down in the description to uh to Sadler and Jason Isbell and the 400 unit and the new record and, and the documentary everything that's happening with y'all and um yeah man hope to speak to you soon thanks y'all appreciate it thanks man Sadler's so cool super nice what a nice guy yeah we just talked to him for like another 20 minutes <laughs> after we stopped rolling <laughs> right. we should have just been recording honestly because it was another really good discussion um yeah yeah, a lot, a lot of great insight and just a, just a cool guy. Done a lot of, you know, like has, has like, I think we need more guitarists like Sadler who are not too concerned about all the ephemera and stuff that goes along with playing guitar and just focuses on playing guitar and enjoying being in that moment. And it's great. Super cool. Yeah, it's song first mentality. Yeah. 
I think is, is what I got from him, which I really appreciate, man. It's, uh, it's, it's something I think we could all learn from. So, um, yeah, thanks again to Sadler for coming on. It definitely won't be the last time he's on the podcast. Uh, like I said, links to all his Instagram, social media, his music, everything will be down in the description box below. Also links to the new, uh, Jason is bowling 400 unit record coming out. And then there's a HBO documentary getting ready yeah. to drop on Jason Isbell as well, uh, which we'll have down below. So, uh, and once again, thanks to the patrons for joining us. They were able to sit in and listen to the interview live while we were recording. So That's if right. you want to uh, join our Patreon, link is down below. You can find out more about the perks and the levels. It's a great way to support the show if you enjoy what we're doing over here. That's right. There's three tiers and you can... Depending on where you're at, you can get different access to discounts for Mythos and all sorts of stuff, early access to episodes, things like that. So check it out. Sign up if you like what we're doing. It helps uh, keep us going. <laughs> yeah. And well, oh. massive thanks to the sponsor of today's video, uh, Sweetwater. Links yes. to our giveaway in the description box down below. You're going to want to win my rig, obviously, but mm. Zach's rig is pretty good too. So don't be upset if you win mm. his. Um I mean, it just obviously goes without saying, but, uh, yeah, Sweetwater, you should check out if you are in the market for, I mean, literally anything gear related, guitar related, we have seen their, uh, their guitar sort of inspection and shipping process. And it is impressive. Yeah. They, they really do everything they can to make the buying experience and, and, and the instrument that you get, whatever you get as 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 great as possible i i just got some some mic stands from them the other day got here in just like a couple of days you know it's a, they're just on it and um great shop check them out uh the giveaway link is sweetwater.com slash dipped in tone so be sure to hit that up but now time chill, chill time. baby let's so chill. you go first because yours we can is, yours is visible kind of yeah yeah right here so uh we'll show a picture of it <clears throat> on the screen because it's gonna be kind of hard to pan my camera down <laughs> right. this is a Tascam 388 studio 8 this is one of those things i feel like it's one of you know, if you know you know kind of thing um so essentially what this is is an eight channel mixer so preamp eq routing busing and an eight track reel-to-reel -reel tape machine in one box it's kind of the only thing that exists like it they were released in i think 85 by tascam uh, and these things have a cult following there's been some really great records made on these like the early black keys stuff uh particularly thick freakness was all cut on a 388 um, a lot of stuff that mac demarco produces and, and releases is done on his 388 uh there, there's a ton of really great like sort of mid-fi indie records cut on this thing and uh they're crazy expensive right now because of the likes of Mac DeMarco and, and all this, they've kind of seen a resurgence. Um, but so I found out about them when I was in Europe, my friend Tice Roofman, who we're playing with is a huge proponent of these things. So I started like really getting obsessed with them, like full on ADHD deep dive on them. <laughs> and um, start, I mean, th these are selling right now, but for between three and $5,000, depending on their condition. So I put out a blast on Instagram, like, Hey, you know, cause the thing is you don't want to ship it. So the problem no. I was having was finding one close enough to me that I could drive and go get it. So put a blast on Instagram and, uh, lo and behold, none other than RJ Ronquillo messaged me back and said, Hey, I have a 388 that I'll sell you. Uh, for a great price. And I said, that's amazing. Are you sure? Because you know, you can get quite a bit more money for it than that. He's like, yeah, that's fine. I don't use it anymore. I just want it to go to a good home. Cut to, uh, he pulled it out, turned it on. It was really noisy, had some noise issues. So he said, you know what? It's not working properly. You can just have it. You can just take oh, it. Oh, really? Yeah. And I said, <laughs> are you sure? Best. Like, cause even for parts, you could sell this thing for thousands of dollars. He's like, yeah, I don't care. Just take it. I want it to go to a good home. So we got it home. Um, and my good friend Tyler Petito from Acorn Amps here in Atlanta. Um, they do some really great pedals and, and everything. He came up this week and we fixed it. It turned out the noise issue was just like a loose, dirty connection on one of the boards. Mm -hmm. A little deoxit, you know. Um, needs a little bit more work. We got to recap the power supply and we have to put a new op amp and the headphone amp and everything. But other than that, it's going to be sick. So yeah. um, It's yeah. incredible. Cool. 
what a can of deoxit can fix <laughs> oh dude deoxit is like the duct tape of the, the it's the gaffer's tape world. of the music industry. <laughs> it's it is a godsend <laughs> man between so a can of deoxit and a can of fader lube i mean there's not much you can't service on a on a console or a mixer you know i know that's right <laughs> yeah well <laughs> that's what i said so yeah so we just saw uh in the episode saddler and red berating uh the the beloved <laughs> green box and uh this past weekend was the amigo guitar show and i went with the guys and even though sitting beside me is three tube screamers i didn't have one of these oh yeah so this wow. is a narrow box tube screamer. Let me hold it next to. There we go. So you can see how much smaller it is. Mm -hmm. um, but what these are is uh, when the when the tube screamer originally came out in like seventy nine, um, they were in the smaller box, and the the circuit's a little different. Like the input and output buffers are on a chip instead of a transistor, and they only made. I mean, this is not an original one. This is the 35th anniversary. They reissued it and put it in the right box and everything. And it, it's just cool. And I have always wanted one. And I got one for a good price from pre-rocked pedals. And um, yeah, now I have, I have, I have more. I have, I have. There's more. And oh, and and yeah. just, just how more. many do you have sitting there right now? <laughs> there's four here, and then I have a bonsai, and then you have two that I bought and sent you. <laughs> Or you yeah, did. Well, or maybe... I have the modded one, and I think no, I think I gave you the regular. Okay, one you back. gave me the other one back, so you have yeah. one. Yeah, I have the and modded then, yeah, one. I have a lot of two. I have a, oh, 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 never mind. <laughs> I have a lot what? of stuff. <laughs> oh, okay. I, well, actually, here. Well, yeah, I have the one. good one. I and gave then you I the... have. This is oh, a yeah. an old Super Overdrive that Brian Wampler modded that I got the other the other day too. But the star of the show is this little mini, this little tiny guy right yeah, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's fine. So, so does anyway, it sound different because of I haven't the, played uh... it yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Because the thing is like, you know, I guess uh, there's been a big to do recently about, you know, the, the TS 10, because I guess oh, uh, yeah. John Myers put one on his board. Right. And oh yeah, the, they all sound the same, don't they? I mean, it's the same. Well, yeah. I mean the same basic topology, like there's a few parts different in, it all kind of changes in the output buffer, which like a TS 808 and the TS nine, I think they, there is a subtle difference. Um, and there's subtle differences between the 10 too, and mainly in the output buffer. But the thing that, that matters is like, well, the thing you have to consider, like all these things have like tolerance, right? Yeah. So of course, after 20 years, 30 years, you know, whatever they, uh, 40 years, they, um, they're going to sway and change and sound different. But like, if you go and buy a bonsai, buy a JHS bonsai and click through them all, you'll be like, oh shit, these basically all sound the same. <laughs> so well there you but go it's, it's cool i like i like it so. yeah no that's no, cool it, honestly it is cool to have like you know for what you do at the it, it makes sense the, yeah. the pedal collect the collecting thing and yeah nice yeah. well there you go everyone uh that's going to be it for this week's episode of dipped in tone i'm happy to be back and, yeah happy uh, to have you back yeah, man. Uh, subscribe down below if you haven't done so already. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or, or anywhere else, be sure to rate us. Leave mm -hmm. a good review. Helps new people find the show. We appreciate that. And uh, we'll see you all real soon. Bye. Bye.